Welcome back to the McCann Dogs podcast, episode 19. And today we have a fine theme and it <laughs> is, it's training 101. And, and Shannon and I uh, talked about this very quickly before we started today's show. And uh, I, I like your um, explanation that you want, we want to talk about some things that we just take for granted you in dog training and, you know, experiences and, and uh, ideas and, um, you know, tips for the average dog owner that, uh, you know, if this is your first dog, maybe it's your fifth dog, but these are experiences that we've, uh, you know, gathered we, some, some choices we've made that we've seen to be really impactful over the course of, uh, our careers. Uh, and I think this is going to be quite helpful for, uh, new dog owners, especially, mm -hmm. uh, and people who are maybe struggling with some, some of their skills, they're just not going right. Yeah, some of the things that we just do because we've been in this for a long time are some of the most important things that you can do, but they're some of the most underrated and overlooked things that you can do. So we thought we would talk about some of the obvious that are, or less than obvious things that make a huge impact on your training. Well, and, and they're obvious to us. Mm -hmm. And we often say, you know, oh, geez, if I could have... Uh, you know, here's an example uh, with Deegan, my black lab. If there were some things I could have changed, I would have definitely made these choices, you know, going back in time. Um, so let's let's dive into, I mean, this is not only going to help you with your training, your skills, but it's also going to help you to identify and uh, eliminate some of the nuisance behaviors, some of the things we're going to talk about today. So regardless of where you are in your training, I think there's going to be lots of value here. Um, one that uh, is especially important for those of you who are a little bit more reserved in your dog training. <laughs> and and I, I'll tell you the amount of times, it's so much harder when we get guys in class, guys are especially bad for this, but when we get guys in class, they have a tendency to be a little bit quieter <laughs> when they're training their dog. And I don't know whether that's, you know, they're, um, I don't know, not as confident to make funny sounds, you use their voice, or they have an expectation that's a little bit different. But I have personally noticed that guys are a little bit, uh, a little bit, I've got to, I've got to bring them out a little bit more yeah. when we're talking about training, but because voice can change your entire training strategy. Yeah, you bet. Voice and how you use it, when you use it, how you teach your dog to recognize it, all those things are so, so important. And what you're talking about in being a little bit more reserved with your voice, we want to genuinely celebrate and play and engage with our dogs. And especially if we're in an environment where there's a lot of distractions around, the more you can keep your dog engaged with you by interacting, by calling them, by touching them, by playing with them, the better your the better chance you will have of having them focus on you despite those distractions. And the more of that you do, the more reinforcing it is. Dogs love to play. They love to engage. They love to interact. That's what they're trying to do when they're trying to go and visit other dogs on the street. So what we need to do is become that other dog for our dogs. We need to become the exciting things. Using your voice in like a genuine celebratory way and an and a genuinely engaging way with your dogs is really going to help to get and keep that focus when the distractions are high. Yeah, I, I was, um, there was a study that's published not that long ago that talked about, um, you know, dogs choosing their owner or a human over food in a lot of situations. And it absolutely makes sense to me. Um, but there's a reason why we need to use food in a lot of uh, uh, applications for, you know, rewarding a specific behavior at a specific time. It's also a currency of reward that a lot of dogs just naturally get. Yeah. But we don't want to always be dependent on something like food and avoid you're using your voice. It's a great way to bridge those rewards to, yeah, you, you know, maintain some focus uh, while you're, you know, setting your dog up for another reward, basically. Yeah. Absolutely. And another thing that's really important with our voice and what you just said is that we're using our voice to get and keep our dog's attention. We're not using food or using toys or using bribes to keep and get our dog's attention. And this makes all the difference because a lot of the times people don't necessarily get the good, clear voice control command trained before their dog is in a situation where they're overfaced by distraction. So a lot of the times it's a judgment call. You know, is my dog ready to hear this command and be able to listen to it? Or is my dog going to drown it out because right now they're overfaced by the distractions? So on one hand, if you were to ask your dog for something when they're in the middle of a situation where they're clearly not going to be able to listen in that scenario, they're just not trained well enough at that point, the distraction is too high, for example, 
in that situation, we don't want to waste our voice. Mm -hmm. So I wouldn't want to, for example, call my dog and have them ignore me and then call them and call them and call them. I might see if I if I could get lucky, but that's the one-off chance. It's, it's very rare that I'm going to do that. In most situations, I want to make sure that my dog is successful. So if chances are great that he's not going to respond to my voice, then I want to go in and I want to use methods that help him get his attention turned to me quickly. So for example, if my dog's sniffing at the edge of the park and I know that he's really invested in that scent, he's not trained well enough yet where I can call his name and he'll turn, I'm not going to call his name. I'm going to walk in close. I'm going to make sure that I'm in a position where I can teach him. I can call his name and give him a touch to make sure he turns and follows through. Or I can call his name and maybe give him a little bit of a tug on the leash. And then when he turns and looks at me, I can throw a big party so that he gets big reinforcement for focusing on me after I've used my voice in that scenario. So it can be a little bit of a judgment call sometimes. Yeah. As a dog trainer, I feel like in a situation like that, if I if I knew, you, you know, you mentioned walking in and making sure you got the turn, um, I would I would insist on a win mm -hmm. you know, in those situations, you know, and if you're out and your dog's in your yard or something, you think, oh boy, I'm, they're definitely not going to respond. Uh, rather than that, I'm going to do X and uh, we can work on it later. I, I think a better strategy is to put yourself in a position where you're going to get a win. You bet. Because these natural training opportunities are so valuable. I love, I love going on a walk to the park with a young dog and for them to get distracted. Mm -hmm. There are some dogs that we've had and, and some dogs we've you know worked with in training that uh, it's really difficult to get them distracted. Yeah. But uh, you know, going for that walk in the park, you know, they lose uh, focus on you a little bit. I mean, that's part of the reason why we're there is to, is to work on some of these exercises. But um, you know identifying ultimately ultimately we're going to train that dog to a position where we can use their voice in it oh, in 100 percent for sure in, in a big part of that again is setting them up to be successful but then proofing uh practicing some of these skills you know so that you are more confident in their response as you went you know in three weeks four weeks two months when you go back to the park and you've had multiple repetitions of success so that they will respond and maybe that's your goal yeah, absolutely. And this is this is another thing that we take for granted because it's just an automatic part of our process. We spend time first in, I call it the clean white room. I'm sure you've all heard that before. We spend time first teaching in the clean white room. So I am teaching my dog his response to name, starting in the hallway, then moving to the living room, then the kitchen, then the front yard, the backyard, et cetera, et cetera. When I get to the park, my dog has already had all of that training in the clean white room. Plus, they've had an opportunity to learn to respond to their name with some mild distractions. You know, I might put uh, a little bit of a distraction out when I'm training in the living room. So there's a toy across the room that my dog can't quite get to, but it's there and it might catch his attention. I might be able to have an opportunity to work his response to name from that. And then I might have a better toy that I get to reward him with. So basically, I have already, when I get to the park, I have already done a lot of due diligence to make sure that my dog understands what the expectation is. When Ned, for example, when he hears that word Ned, he needs to be clear on what the expectation is before I challenge him with distractions at the park. Mm -hmm. So he's already had all that repetition at home. Now we go to the park, he gets to the edge of the park and he's sniffing a little bit. You know, he might be on a long line or something of that nature if he's still a six or seven month old puppy. Um, and if he's sniffing at one side of the park, now I'm going to wager whether or not I think he's ready for that test. Okay, so have I practiced enough response to name with elements that he's sniffing already? Have I practiced enough response to name with novel elements where I'm there and I'm I'm doing the touch to get the automatic turn from him? And if I can answer yes to those things, now I might try a test. This might be an appropriate time to test depending on where I'm at with my training. I am never going to do that more than once though if yeah. I am not successful at it. So basically, if I do call Ned's name and he turns from that edge of the park where he's sniffing the grass, I'm going to throw a party. I'm probably going to run away so he gets to chase me only after he has actually responded though. I want to make sure that the chase is a reward for turning, not a lure to, to get him to turn. So as he's chasing me, I'm throwing the party. When he catches me, I can have a toy or I can have food. We can have a blast and genuinely celebrate. That's another great way to use my voice there telling him how wonderful and how great he is. If, on the other hand, I called him in that situation and he didn't, you know, he's just overfaced. It's too much distraction for him. I say Ned and he keeps sniffing. I'm going to walk in nice and close. I'm going to repeat Ned just to make sure that he hears it right before he feels that little touch or the poke on the butt mm -hmm. or whatever it is I'm doing to make sure he knows. 
ignoring me, buddy, is not an option. And then again, when he turns and, and in response to that touch, I'm not mad at him. I'm not going to tell him he's a bad dog. I'm going to tell him he's a great dog because now he's focused on me. We're going to have a little play. I'm not probably not going to feed that one because I want to keep the ultimate rewards for when he works really hard. Yeah. I might keep my toy in my pocket for that one and just have a little play with him and let him know he's great. And then I might send him back to that thing to sniff again, but I'm going to repeat it now with name and automatic touch. So I'm going to get in a couple where I make sure he turns automatically each time, then I might go back to a test. We need to talk a little bit about um, uh, differentiating between good responses and great responses. Mm. I think that's a good thing to talk about Love in this that. episode. Um, but I, a couple of notes I, I do, just thinking about as you were talking is the type of voice that you use is less important than how authentic it is. Mm -hmm. You know, a lot of people make comments about how their dog perks up when Kale, Kale says yes, <laughs> you know, on our YouTube videos <laughs> or in class or whatever, that their dogs get really excited. And, and I, I um, truly believe that uh, if you at home have your dog and you're genuinely in, in, as enthusiastic about their success as Kale is about you and your dog's success, you will see those same kinds of turns. It's not about a tone of voice. It's yeah. not about, it's what works for your dog. And that's something that you're going to learn over time. You know, I don't have a very high pitched squeaky uh, uh, voice, but if I, you know, I, I can use a, a gruff and grumbly, whatever that thing is that connects me to uh, uh, my dog, that's powerful. Mm -hmm. you know, it's very powerful and it doesn't need to be a certain kind of, of praise. It's yeah. whatever just naturally comes to you, but you do need to be a little bit invested in that success. And when you do that, you'll start to have more genuine responses. Absolutely. And, you know, you'll get to know your dog. You'll get to know what they like. I, I, labs always spring to mind whenever I hear things like gruff and grumbly and right. rustly. And I, I, so I'm always using labs as an example because they're very rough and tumble dogs. Yes. But I could picture a lab just going wild for that type of play yeah. and that type yeah. of interaction and a shove away and, you know. Yeah. Yeah. Really good engagement. The, the other thing uh, I think about is the fact that we use yes as uh, uh, you know, as a marker to mm -hmm. uh, mark the moment when our dog is making a great choice and why using your voice to say yes is better than using a clicker in a lot of circumstances. Number one, it's always on you. You bet. You know, especially when you're puppy training, there's a million times uh, that I can, you know, I'm just exaggerating a little bit, but there's multiple times throughout the day where I'll catch a puppy doing something that I love yeah. and I want to be able to mark that moment and then reward it. You bet. Absolutely. Clickers can be cumbersome and can take some planning. You know, in order to tell your dog they're right with a clicker, you need to have it in your hand to begin with. And that's just not realistic in day to day life. So I use clickers when I am shaping with my dogs or doing very intricate types of training because they're very, they're excellent for pinpointing very specific things. And there's a whole bunch of scientific information behind that, that the reason why it is. But for your day to day life, you have your voice on you all the time. Um, however, you know, having said that, I do know people that will click with their mouths or click with their uh, little snap of their fingers or something of that nature. You can certainly do that as well. I think what's really important to note about yes versus other types of voice and praise is that yes is very specifically an event marker mm -hmm. or click is very mm -hmm. specifically an event marker. Yeah. You know, the... Um, um, I, I remember back in the day thinking like, what is this device? Like, what are you supposed to do? You're supposed to click it and the dog hears it and comes back to you? I don't right, understand. Right. Definitely not the way to use it. Yeah. And it's been a long, long time since I've uh, been that confused about a clicker. <laughs> Hopefully. Yeah. Basically, the idea with the conditioned reinforcer is that it marks something your dog has done right to earn reward. It is meant to be the whistle when the dolphin goes through the hoop. You know, there's no way you're getting the fish to that dolphin when it's in the middle of the hoop, but you want to let it know that's what it did right. So the whistle that marks for the dolphin, it's the same thing for the dog. You know, their butt hits the ground on the word sit. You would mark yes the moment their butt hit the ground. That says you have done something to earn reward. That is what that word or that marker does. Very specifically different than praise. All of that, yay, good girl, good boy. All of that is wonderful, engaging, genuine celebration with your dog. It's great, but it doesn't specifically say anything to the dog mm -hmm. other than we're having a party. Yeah. And tonality is important. I know some people mm -hmm. say, well, I use yes all the time in like day-to-day -day talking with people. You I hope you do. Uh, you know, I hope there are lots of opportunities to say yes to things in your life. But nice. <laughs> when I'm saying yes uh, to mark a, a moment, you know, what's my condition reinforcer, that's a, 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 a more um, 
uh, acute, a, a more a, sh a little sharp. Yes, yeah, you, you know, bet. I really want to use that short, uh, single syllable words to mark that moment of greatness. Yeah, and uh, your dog will very quickly learn the difference. Yeah, you bet. And I mean, if you really are concerned that that word is going to be soured in your day to day life, pick a different word that yeah. you're not like. Yeah. You pick yip. Yep. Yep. He's prob you're probably not walking around saying yip in your day-to-day -day life or um, anything. <laughs> un unless you're Yosemite <laughs> Sam. Because if you're Yosemite, yip, yip, yay, or whatever he used to say, and then he'd shoot his uh, six shooters in the air. <laughs> I think that's how it works anyway. We'll have to have a little uh, little graphic going across the screen <laughs> yeah, there. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, if you're watching this on our YouTube podcast channel and I don't have Yosemite Sam up here, uh, <laughs> there's been a copyright claim and I've had to take that video down. <laughs> Uh, we need to talk about equipment, yeah. and uh, this is uh, something that uh, we get lots of questions about. It's uh, We have uh, very particular choices for the equipment that we use because we've just got such a huge d a data set, you know, so yeah. many uh, dogs of, of so many years of experience with different uh, instructors teaching the same kinds of students to know what's the best equipment for you as a, a new dog owner. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, we do understand that different dogs will, might require some variations of these things, but there's some go-to equipment that we always choose. Yeah, you bet. Um, my goal with equipment is always to find something that is safe and kind and effective for the dog that allows me to keep control. So before I can rely on my voice, I need to make sure that I have a handle on my dog that might come in the form of a collar and a leash or a house line or a long line. I just need to make sure that I have enough on my dog that I can always take control. Mm -hmm. And we talk a lot about management in addition to training. So mm -hmm. it's not just about the things you're teaching. It's about the things that you're allowing your dog to do in the interim while you're teaching them those good skills. Mm -hmm. So for example, if they are chewing everything in the house when you're not supervising, that basically gives them an opportunity to rehearse that bad behavior of chewing the wrong thing. So we use crates as management tools so that we can continue to live our lives because mm -hmm. it's not realistic for us to spend 24 seven with the puppy, we can continue to live their lives and they can be safe. You know, they come out of the crate, we have a collar and a leash on them all the time or a house line on, on them all the time. And the goal of that is to have a handle. So basically when the, when our pups are loose in the house, they're always under our watchful eye. Until they know the rules of the house, I never let my dog out of my sight. So I'll set up with baby gates and X pens. If they're outside of the crate, I make sure that they're contained in the same space that I am. And while that's happening, I make sure that they're dragging a long line with the handle cut off. I don't hold it in my hand. I'm not using it to yeah. control the puppy's motion around the house. Or, or tie it to your belt or anything like yeah, that. No, yeah, no, exactly. I want my puppy to be free to make choices within yeah. the confines of the choices I've allowed him access to. So I'm not going to leave, you know, an open garbage can, for example, in my gated off area with a puppy who has no understanding that that rustling through the garbage is not allowed. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to set up my situation so that he really is forced to make the right choices. But within that, I'm also going to make sure that I have a fail safe in place so that if he does make the wrong choices, I have a handle. Basically, that long line in the house and that collar is just there so that if he does find something that I haven't thought about beforehand and he goes to run for the hills, you know, maybe he finds a a sock that somehow got into my controlled area because I'm not apparently not a good housekeeper or something of that nature. <laughs> so he finds a sock and he goes to run away with it. Instead of me chasing him around the living room, I can just calmly step on the line and I can stop him from realizing that that is a really fun game to play. Yeah. And I can just calmly take it away from him. I'm not angry. He's yeah. a puppy. He's yeah. doing what puppies do. They they pick up things that are in their midst and they try to play with them and they try to make sense of them. And you know that's just the way it is. So I'm just going to direct him to a better activity from there. If he was persistent in trying to do the same thing that he wasn't allowed to do over and over again, say for example, it's chewing on a piece of the rug and I told him, no, you leave that be and brought him over and gave him something better to do and gave him a little bit more of a productive time and he went back to chew that piece of the rug again. Now I have that line where I might be able to say, hey, leave that and give him a little pop, pop, pop away from the rug, make it unpleasant enough, not overly so, but yeah. unpleasant enough for him to keep chewing on that rug and then I'm going to encourage him over I, again i'm not mad i'm just giving him direction and information yeah. i'm going to encourage him over to something he can do and i am going to help him be productive in that and i would say if he goes back to it a third time i probably need to set up my situation a little bit better because he's not ready for that kind of freedom he's making the wrong choices in again yeah and that um 
I don't know what the word is. If it's sort of a, an, an objective, uh, you know, an emotionless uh, redirect mm -hmm. is so important. And if you don't have something like a house line on, that means you've got to reach down, take up your puppy. You know, maybe you've got to reach in for their collar and all of a sudden it turns into a game where in a situation where the puppy's chewing on something or doing something that you don't like, you can literally just step on that line so mm -hmm. the puppy can't escape and then take hold of the line and... and turn them away, yeah. you know, move them away from that, from that thing. And then as you mentioned, you know, you can redirect them onto something that you do like. You can also add a little uh, sit. You, I mean, you mm -hmm. can, you can ask them for some work yeah. after that thing. Like, Hey buddy, listen, I don't like that, but I do like this. Yeah. And now that you've put in a little bit of work, look at this great chew toy that you can, you can have something, something like that, you know, and a house line is such an effective way Absolutely. to stop the, that, the craziness <laughs> of, of puppy, uh, you know, puppy, puppy burns, you know, of, of puppies getting into trouble in the house. It's just such a nice way to have control. And it makes you look like a puppy training superhero to your puppy. <laughs> you, you are four feet away. How did you stop me, yeah. you know, from climbing up the stairs or whatever the thing is that you don't like? Yeah. Now, um, let's move a little bit away. I, okay, let's talk about management for a moment. Very quickly, management, as we've mentioned before in podcasts, is equally as important as training. And we've mentioned the... Uh, uh, crate uh, for mm -hmm. using for management. You know, if you can't have eyes on your puppy in the beginning, then uh, they should be in their crate. Um, you talked about baby gates. Mm -hmm. uh, we've talked about uh, house lines. Now let's talk about puppies that are just a little bit older. Mm -hmm. And now we're outside. Yeah. Using something like a long line might be just as effective. I mean, it is, it's it basically the extended version, the longer version of your house line for outdoors. You bet. Absolutely. And this is a great way of allowing your puppy to have a little bit more freedom. You know, we, we want to make sure that we can exercise them and we can play with them and we can have some fun. You know, I, I don't want to go out in the backyard and just walk around with my dog on a six foot leash. I want to be able to interact and engage and call him from one side of the yard and let him chase me and, you know, play all the fun games and whatnot. So I'm going to have something that allows me to take control when I need to. And it's going to be as long as it needs to be yeah. for that dog. You know, I've had some dogs that I I've been, you know what, I am happy with this dog on a six foot house line since he was six months old. Life is perfect. I've had other dogs where I've had to have 20 feet because they'll range a little bit further. And yeah. I want to be able to reinforce anything I want to at any point that I want to do it. I want to make sure I, I can always take control. I can always come up with a training plan. I can always practice some sort of skill and I can always get to the Right, endpoint. Mm -hmm. So that long line allows me to do that. Again, we were talking about response to name earlier. The long line just allows me to reinforce myself if I need to. If I have gotten to the point where now I'm out at the park, my dog is really reliable in his responses, so I'm letting him range out, you know, 15 or 20 feet to investigate things and, and explore the world, I need to make sure that I can still get his focus back from that distance. So my long line is going to be long enough to suit that. We, um, I just thought of something as you were talking about the long line. I mean, it, it is such a great tool, but when we, we sort of breezed over crates kind of, and, um, I, I thought of a student, we have students in, uh, I think Sweden or mm -hmm. something or students uh, like online training students with us. And they've mentioned that, uh, I believe it's in their country using mm -hmm. a crate is only allowed for things like puppy potty training mm -hmm. in transportation or at the vet. And there might be another inclusion, but mm -hmm. I don't remember what it is, but, um, you know, I started to think occasionally get questions on the YouTube channel, like, well, what if you don't have a crate? You know, is there an alternative if you don't have a crate or can't buy one, don't want one, whatever. Um, and, and I think this is some, I think this is confusing for some puppy owners because we say crate and they think, okay, they mean specifically a, you know, a box mm -hmm. that's, you know, has either it's wire cage sided or whatever, or it's plastic and it's got a door on the front. But ultimately if, if you, for whatever reason, can't use, can't get whatever, can't, can't, can't use a crate. Mm -hmm. Then there are alternatives, you know, yeah. we, I think about what's the ultimate objective here, you know, it, yeah. it, it, safety, it, safety, 100%. Mm -hmm. And we're thinking of a crate when we say crate, we're thinking of a limited space area that your puppy can't get into trouble that, they, that you teach them that it's their safe spot that they can go and hang out. You bet. And it doesn't really matter if it's a specific brand, uh, whatever, Roughland or whatever. I don't <laughs> even know if that's a brand. But, you know, it doesn't need to be anything specific. But what it does need to do is provide your puppy enough space to stand up, turn around, lie down comfortably, and keep them out of trouble. And I think that's so important for people to, you know, um, a lot of people take our, uh, you know, advice or uh, training so literally that um, they don't see past mm -hmm. the idea of, 
what a crate does. And I think that's really important to understand. Yeah, you bet. There's so much value that comes out of crates. Yeah. I, I mean, when we have baby puppies, we use a nice tight crate so that they don't have room to go and pee in one half and sleep comfortably in the other. So the crate essentially helps them learn how to hold their bladder and hold mm. their bowels. The crate is a great way of helping to build independence with your puppy. There's yeah. so many reasons that we use the crate. Once, Essentially, though, once they're over that period of time where we're worried about them having accidents inside the crate, you can go to a little bit of a bigger space. Now, we'll qualify this a little bit because there are there are situations where you want to have more confinement and more control. So if you had a dog that's in training that is challenging you, for yep. example, yeah. that is a little bit more inclined to want to go off and do their own thing. I don't want to call those things stubborn, but there's a lot of dogs that are much easier to distract and much uh, yeah. much more ready to buy into those distractions. And a lot, a lot depends on, on breed. A lot depends on individual tendencies as well. But basically that dog where I'm trying to really control Control what he gets reinforced for in his life, that dog, I'm probably going to use the crate as confinement a lot longer in his life mm. until he starts to see more value in me. And now I'm starting to get somewhere in my training. If I have a dog that's an adolescent and it's pushing buttons, for example, I might want to use more of a confinement crate. Like there's been some regression this way. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. But if I have a dog that's coming along in their training, life is wonderful. There's no real, I'm not really dealing with any major obstacles. They just need to learn and, you know, life is wonderful and I don't really need to make a huge impact when it comes to freedom. I might use an X-Pen so that they have a little bit more room so that they can, and an X-Pen is usually, I would say, about maybe six by six, eight by eight. Yeah, which um, they're, you know, you can fold them in and create whatever shape or size you might need. Yeah, that's yeah. a great point. You could attach a bunch together and make it yep. as big as you want. But yeah. basically it still, it, it, it confines the dog, yep. but not in such a restrictive way because mm -hmm. that you might not necessarily need that sort of restriction to get your dog focusing more on you. So if things are swimming, you can start to give them more and more freedom and see how things go. If at any point though, you feel like, things start to slip or they start to make mistakes again, don't hesitate to take that freedom back away. And that's, we say this all the time, that's the difference in dog trainers versus people who are not, um, who don't train professionally. They, we recognize so quickly how easy it is for problems to crop up. And the first sign of them, we're right on it with yeah, our dogs. Yeah. You know, as soon as my dog started, you know, if I left him in the X pen, for example, and all of a sudden I came in and he had chewed a little piece of the carpet, which he had never done before. And I was blown away. I'm not going to leave that yeah. to chance that it happens again. That, that dog's situation is going to change. He's no longer going to be unsupervised in any situation where he might make that mistake again. First off, I don't want my carpet chewed. And second, off, it's dangerous for him. Yep. You know, he could swallow a piece of that carpet and that could be the end of that puppy. So I want to make sure that he's safe and contained in a way that uh, that applies well for that specific situation. People will uh, say, oh, well, you know, that's that seems pretty dramatic. I mean, he just, you know, chewed on a little bit of bedding. And when we talk about, you know, bedding, uh, bedding is earned in the crate. Mm -hmm. um, but it's because we've seen yeah. so many times this go horribly awry for people. So, you know, we really do have your safety in mind. Um, I, I um, As you were talking Talking about the uh, the part about the, some dogs are more easily distracted. What the root of that might be is is as as difficult as it is to hear. That dog doesn't see you as someone worth listening to mm -hmm. yet. And, and you know it's so hard to. I would have never thought that as a student when I came to McCann Dogs. I just you know I thought oh she's just really distracted. But what I had done is set this set up Deegan this my my lab. Uh, to not really um, see me as someone worth listening to, she she would she would much rather follow something else, you know, follow a, a distraction or you know what whatever, do her own thing, because I hadn't I hadn't gotten to a point in our relationship where uh, it was worth working a little bit for mm -hmm. me, or it was worth listening to me. And uh, once I figured that out, I used the crate for management. And I know I've talked about that here several times. But once we figured that out, man, oh man, did it expedite my training. Makes a huge difference. It's massive. Yeah. Such a big difference. And it's just so worth it. So, you know, if you're on the fence at home and you're thinking, well, geez, I don't know. Uh, and Deegan was two at the time. I mean, we, we talked about this with uh, rescue dogs, how uh, giving them somewhere safe like a crate is a great way to bring them into a new household. Yes. You know, 
because you can it's a it's a great training opportunity it's something you can work on together and, and it keeps them out of trouble yeah. just like it would your eight week old puppy yeah it also gives structure to the yeah. situation yeah. so rather than being in this new situation where they're potentially overwhelmed they have this nice safe little space and it's probably something that they've become used to if they've been in a rescue situation they've probably been in a kennel or been in crates and this following them into their new life where there's usually a, a little bit of a honeymoon period with any older dog coming home there's a very small one with puppies uh, they get over it much quicker than adult dogs though but there's usually a honeymoon period with adult dogs so if you're getting a rescue that is not a puppy keep in mind that 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 decompression period when they come home is really important and having a couple of weeks with a lot of structure and some place where they can feel safe will likely make the transition for that dog much easier as we talk about some of uh you know older dog skills um and even for puppy skills something we have to talk about is a loose loose leash yeah. and it is the thing that is it, this idea or, or being aware of this is the thing that could change your loose leash walking entirely and yeah this is something people often overlook and they just think oh well my dog's in a great position or you know he's not pulling me right now or uh, sometimes um you know the dog's in a great position and then our the student accidentally turns into the statue of liberty and they raise that <laughs> leash hand up in the sky holding the flame and then they reward their dog on a tight you leash hear music somewhere that's right yeah <laughs> But but it it is so impactful and and ultimately we our goal here at McCann Dogs is to help you to 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 have a dog that loves to listen whether they're on leash mm -hmm. they're off leash they're in your backyard or wherever wherever they are and a big part of that giving them good information is you know being consistent and a good way to be consistent is making sure that your leash is always loose mm -hmm. yeah absolutely and and this is the one that we probably take for granted the most because it is so automatic when that leash is on to put slack in it i don't even think about it i clip a leash on and i instantly just put slack yeah, into the yeah. leash so that there's a nice gentle J shape. And we teach a concept called leash respect, which basically puts the onus of responsibility on the dog to not pull on the leash. So as long as you're doing your job as a handler and you're not pulling on the leash, your dog will adjust and keep that leash loose if you train the concept properly. And it's absolutely brilliant. The, the whole idea behind having the leash is that it allows us to control the dog while we teach skills on verbal command. Yeah. Eventually, I want my dog to have no idea what the difference is between being on leash and being off leash, which means I need to be extremely diligent about not putting any tension pardon me, into that collar with the leash. I need to make sure it's always slack. I need to make sure my dog knows that his job is to keep it slack as well. And now when I take the leash off, there's really no difference yeah. because I haven't been pulling on the leash. I've been using my voice the whole time. My dog has learned to be responsive to my voice. Now the leash comes off, they're still responsive to my voice. But if they're used to hearing my voice with a tight leash and with physical cues on the leash as they hear things, that is unfortunately going to hurt me when I take the leash off. Sometimes we see it in our advanced classes in, in the building, but um, you can see a dog kind of turn their brain off too. If they're yeah. on a tight leash, they don't have to think. And as you increase the challenge, maybe you increase your expectations a little bit. You want to go some you know more challenging places with your dog and, and you're working on loose leash walking. The moment that leash gets tighter, there's you know tension on their collar, uh, they don't have to use their brain anymore. And yeah. that is the opposite of what we want to do. We want them to be a little bit more self-aware and certainly more aware of you. Yeah, absolutely. And I've had students that I've said, hey, your arm's up in the air again. You don't realize it. Hold on to your belt loop. I have actually had students in grade three where I did do the tethering thing because I thought, you know what? This person is constantly leash, the hands on the leash and yeah. just automatically without thinking about it, their hands are going to the leash. So I'm going to get the leash in, out of their hands completely, but I still wanted to make sure they had enough control of the dog. So their goal was to have that leash attached to their belt loop with hands free and the things that that their hands were busy with was interacting, engaging with the dog, touching, moving away, pulling out toys and rewards, et cetera. Yeah. Um, so so it, it, whether that's walking on leash, maybe it's sitting in at your side. I know that um, yeah, it's, anything. It's, a, it's almost reflexive that if you're working on, you know, having your dog sit politely when people come up, um, sometimes people will, as you know, as that distraction, that new person uh, approaches, sometimes people will like just add a little bit of tension. Like if I hold my dog in position, they're going to make the right choice. Yeah. But, <laughs> but making making the choice is the important part. They're yeah. probably going to get up, especially yeah. if you're early in your training. They're probably going to make that mistake. But that part is in, as important to the learning as them sitting in position. Absolutely. Because if, if that was happening, if my dog got up out of the sit, 
I would place them back. And then I would put the slack back in the leash and allow them the opportunity to make that mistake again. I do not ever want to physically hold my dog in position because yeah. he's not making a choice. And when that leash comes off, guess what? Yeah. I can't physically hold him anymore. So nice loose leash all the time. If he's going to get up, let him get up place them back, loosen the leash, let them make that choice. Yeah. When we're talking about making choices, an important way to start to introduce more distractions and, and, and you know, really up your game is by adding some, one of the three Ds. There's, we have distance, distraction, and duration. And we'll only increase one of these at a time, but it's a great way to um, deepen an understanding of a skill. It's a great way to give your dog new experiences uh, without being overwhelming. And I think understanding that as a dog trainer, you know, the, the, the distraction level one is pretty obvious. Mm -hmm. The dirt, I mean, independently, they're pretty obvious, but it's as a, a dog owner who's focused on the, what am I doing? You know, mm -hmm. how, what do I do when this happens? You do need to be careful that you're not accidentally adding, or you're, when your dog's successful, a common pitfall is to, let's say it's a stay, you ask your dog to stay and then you walk 10 feet away and then you toss a football in the air or, you know, you whatever, you, you add some distraction. One thing at a time. Yeah, you bet. You need to be really aware of that. You bet. And eventually you can compound all those things. Once you've mastered them all individually, you can start to stack them all together and test the dog and put them through their paces in terms of a proofing scenario. But initially we want to make sure that we're not throwing too much at the dog. And Listen to the dog for feedback too. You know, I keep training journals. They're sloppy and messy and they're scribbles and they're they're awful to try to go back and reference after any period of time. But while I'm in the training process with that dog, they're absolutely amazing because I'll check my training journal just before I set out for a training and I'll just refresh my memory of exactly what happened the last training set. Oh, he had trouble at the park. And you know what? They had just cut the grass that day. So there's all sorts of new smells. And I mean, those are the things that you really need to think about with dogs because those are the the, the that's the level they're thinking on, right? They're not thinking about the the traffic and being uh, being worried about busy roads, et cetera. They're thinking about the exciting smells and the things at the park and their predatory instincts and whatnot. Yeah, so yeah. if we can train through those behaviors and make sure that they clearly understand how to respond in those scenarios by breaking it down, working out one D at a time, and then starting to bring those things back together and being fair to our dogs as well. You know, listening to that feedback. So if I check my, my training journal and it says grass was just cut, smells were intense, Ned had a hard time. Now I'm going to plan this training session to build on that one. Yeah. So I'm not going to repeat the exact same thing and have him fail, but I might go to the park the next time they've cut the grass or find a freshly cut area and work just outside of that and really tidy up whatever the response is that I'm looking for and then venture out into the cut grass again to build on that skill. Then I might build some distance in that grass with the extra distraction. You know, I can stack those things once my dog's ready for it and make him a master champion of yeah. any sort of distraction. Yeah, absolutely. Um, you, you talked about your um, journal having many pages. What's your go-to doodle in your journal? <laughs> <laughs> Is there one that's... You know what? There's like toller noses all over the place. I do a lot of like drawing little toller noses noses on my uh, on my doodles. But <laughs> other than that, I don't think I really doodle too much. Yeah. Hmm. I often, uh, I have a default spirally circle thing oh, do you? that I'm, you know, I'm often thinking and I'll just do a spirally circle thing on whatever I'm, I'm, I'm jotting <laughs> notes down about, but that's, that's my go-to. So if anybody, if anyone finds a training journal and it's got a spirally circle thing on the front <laughs> and on the back, yours. probably mine. <laughs> yeah. I didn't put my name on it. Now, um, uh, as we talk about some of these, um, you know, uh, sort of t tips for training your dogs. Some of the insights that we've gained over the years of being professional dog trainers, we need to talk about some uh, individual students' uh, needs and challenges. Mm -hmm. And um, if you are uh, one of our online students or one of our in-class students, you have access to, to instructors who can guide you uh, along the way. You can get these kinds of insights mm -hmm. specific to your dog, which is really what people need. Uh, you know, this is, this is when we're coming up with an online program a few years ago, I, I was thinking, you know, what would I have wanted? And, and you yeah. know, I'm, you know, I'm not, I wasn't super tech savvy at that time, but this has, you need help when you're yeah. training a dog. You need someone that can, you know, give you insight or, or advice or say, hey, you know what? Every time you you walked back, your dog got up and you re you rewarded them or you started to reach out or you need these, these kinds you of bet. tips. 
And um, if you're listening to this, you know, on our podcast, you have access to something like our online training courses, things like our Puppy Essentials course for dogs under mm -hmm. five months, and then Life Skills for Dogs five months and over. And uh, maybe we can briefly just talk us to talk a little bit about you know what you're doing in the online training for our students. Yeah, absolutely. So we are um, online with two the two courses you mentioned, Puppy Essentials and Life Skills, and they are fully supported by the McCann Dogs team. So basically you do your learning with all of the videos that are supplied through the school, but you join us once a week for live Zoom classes. And those Zoom classes are also recorded so that depending on what time zone you're in in the world, you might not wanna get up at 2 a.m. to watch a Zoom class. So you might have to miss one week. We do rotate them around so that we can we can catch everybody's time zone. Um, but they're recorded so that you can go back and watch up to four months worth of previously recorded Zoom classes. So all sorts of things. We talk about nipping, we talk about Leash respect. We deep dive into all sorts of really wonderful topics to help our students figure out that why so yeah. that they can apply their own knowledge and learning to their training moving forward. Um, we spend a ton of time in our support group. We love that group. It's um, basically it's set up so that you have a dog trainer in your back pocket. Yeah. You can post videos for us to critique. You can just ask questions. Uh, if you prefer a more one on one conversation, you can reach out to us by email. So we are accessible and you can learn in the support group along with everybody as well as having a guided program to work with. And along with that, you and, and I, I love that we sort of got to this last because I think um, the important stuff is getting feedback. But uh, you have access to hours of training content broken mm -hmm. up into tiny little sessions, yeah. which is really, really helpful. So if you're interested in that, check out the show notes below, or if you're watching here on a YouTube podcast channel, check out the description for our Puppy Essentials or our Life Skills program. Now, Shannon, I want to thank you for joining us. Episode 19, we're, we've moved out of the teens. Now we're into the, the 20s of, of season two. Um, any final Plenty words? Of 20s. Any, any final words for our <laughs> teens? Have fun with your dogs, guys. You know what? It's been a great uh, 10 podcasts in the Ab teens. <laughs> absolutely. And I want to thank you guys for joining us. If this is your first time here on our podcast channel, make sure you like, follow, and or subscribe. And we look forward to the next one. On that note, I'm Ken. I'm Shannon. Happy training, guys. Bye for now. Bye, everybody. I hope you enjoyed this episode of the McCann Dogs podcast. And if you'd like some more training resources, be sure to check us out on YouTube, Instagram, and Facebook at McCann Dogs. And if you'd like to train with us online, be sure to check out the show notes below for our My Dog Can online training program, where we know in just a few weeks, your dog will become a well-behaved family member. Until then, happy training.